So uh, do understand that the hopes of young India has changed. We no more uh, uh, rely or depend on uh, what West sees as elite or, as I said, their indexes. Bharat is seeking a geopolitical role where where America and and the Western collective together will have to accommodate a big chunk of decision making that has to happen in Delhi, which is why each of these countries are being told you're going to enter a bilateral free trade agreement with us uh, and you're going to trade on our terms. This is The Global Gambit. What follows is a conversation with Dr. Ankit Shah, speaker, author, someone who got their PhD in the impact of e-commerce and relationship of trade to consumer protection, but as someone who has become very notable in the areas of due economics and political discussion about India's growing rise and unprecedented influence in international affairs. We covered his perspectives about the Indian election and what it could mean for the country, or in many people's eyes, Bharat's re-establishment in the 21st century. We started off, though, with a joke about how I can't really pronounce Bharat. And some of you I know when I've hosted Gautam de Saraju were very uh, displeased with my pronunciation. But keep in mind that I am an Englishman who's trying to understand more about Bharat, the history, and generally do a better job of, I think, connecting uh, in areas where a lot of Western people don't even bother. So uh, please bear with me. But jokes aside, we are talking about India and Bharat and the election. As of 19th of April, uh, the uh, country has gone to start voting. Now, this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, the world has ever seen in terms of an election. Almost one eighth of the world's population. It's about 968,821,000 people are uh, able eligible to vote. That's the population of America, Brazil, Russia, Japan, the UK, France, and Belgium combined. And that's just in one country. You've got almost 500 million male voters and then just over 470 million female voters. And of that, 180 million are first-time voters, i.e. they are 18 or 19 years old. So these are just some of the statistics about the size of the election. And Ankit has joined me again to give us his perspective about what the election means, how he thinks it could go for the incumbent government, the BJP, led by Modi, um, and also you know a few other issues such as India's role in the world. But Ankit, it's lovely to have you back. How are you looking at this election in the next few weeks? Uh, thank you for hosting me again. Well, this is the largest exercise of democracy anywhere on this planet. And uh, in terms of the democratic origins of our nation, it just goes back to history. I mean, even even before the Christ, I mean, the Lichavis and the Shakyas used to have democracy formats with the election format no. of uh, ballot box and stuff like that. And uh, I mean, it's for, for the West, it is very new that uh, very recent that women started to vote, but for us, it's always been the case. So um, this is a big exercise going on, uh, and the people of the country realize that they are electing a global leader. They are not electing a national leader at the moment. And to my understanding, the expectations are that the foundations will be laid to the, what we call as the concept of Akhand Bharat. Akhand Bharat means the Indian subcontinent. So, uh, uh, very conveniently, um, because of the imposition of the Western templates, uh, the West Asia started to be called as Middle East. Similarly, uh, you know, the Indian subcontinent started to be called as South Asia. So, in the decolonization process, we are going to see reversal of these two terminologies. Uh, and what that means is that you shouldn't be surprised if, as I said, Pakistan occupied Kashmir is something that we are going to grab back again. So we look at this third term as massive reforms, as we all know that our leader uh, does intricate planning for the entire nation. And to our understanding, as he has also rightly mentioned now, he has all the plans till 2047 date-wise plans about what the country needs to achieve. So we are looking for 
uh, massive reforms coming in in the third term, be it education sector, be it the startup ecosystem, uh, be it the judiciary, uh, or be it uh, the, the, the international trade formats. So uh, the first 100 days itself will begin with big bank reforms as soon as the dollar comes to power. So uh, we are looking at a, a thumping majority in this election for this government. It's a third term that is the prime minister is going to have. Uh, it is very unheard for a country of our size to have a leader uh, giving delivering the governance which is completely non-corrupt because the, the past history that we had of this nation there were parties who used to make a lot of money out of uh, government coffers, contracts and stuff like that. So this is the first time that two terms have gone without a single uh, a real corruption allegation against the government. And this has been possible because of the great mother of the prime minister, her virtues, that the family has kept complete distance from the prime minister, which is why... Uh, you are able to deliver a complete non-corrupt governance, talk to bottom across the nation. Uh, the kind of infrastructure work that has happened, uh, unheard of. The airports have simply doubled, the IITs have simply doubled, the IIMs have simply doubled, about 27.75 lakh crores of rupees given to the, for the self-employment and entrepreneurship model under the Mudra Yojana. About 4 crore people went, uh, got shelter and home uh, under his leadership before the Ram Mandir, uh, Bhagwan Ram entered the Mandir. So uh, I think sweeping reforms across uh, for the lower strata of the society in a way where the self-esteem of the commoners have boomed like crazy. I mean, they, they don't care if some elite person is sitting beside. They don't even care. That is the kind of self-esteem the prime minister has brought to the common citizens. One of the things I remember learning from Gutam in our conversation was about India and the acronym Indian National Development Inclusive Alliance, right? And he was very amused because it's, in his perspective, and I think a lot of people's perspectives, a very weak attempt to develop a coalition to challenge the BJP and Modi, right? Um, and from my most recent reading into it, I'm not an expert on Indian domestic politics, but I try to be aware of the changes and from what I understood, the alliance, the coalition had basically collapsed. There was internal fighting amongst uh, a lot of the small and regional parties. What, what's your perspective go with that? And and generally, the opposition, main opposition Congress party, are they completely, uh, you know, going to be decimated? It's very Western influenced. Therefore, you know, a lot of Indians don't want to see them in any any influence of power. Right? What's your take there? Well. Well, the first of all, the, the main party in that coalition being the Congress party. Mm. They have, they have been in power for more than 60 years of the history of this nation. And, 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 and the citizens have seen that nothing being delivered. And there are a lot of corruption. There's a dynastic politics happens that the same family is ruling time and again, the next generation and the next generation. Uh, and I think. Uh, mostly it's the development part, which is completely lacking on their front. They do not have any kind of a vision to give to the masses. They don't offer any vision. Uh, what they offered even in this election is freebies. The same Karl Marx formula of vote bans. So uh, I think uh, people reject this. They don't want freebies. They want empowerment. Uh, they want infrastructure. They want better education facility. They want better safety and security, they want better infrastructure, uh, which is why I don't see this alliance going, uh, doing anything in this election. I mean, they are going to be wiped out in the sense, the last time also they haven't gotten much of the seats. So it doesn't look like they would be able to arrange any kind of uh, coming back to power or any of that kind of stuff. They are going to sit in the opposition, decimated. So you think that there is a, a general, well, I mean, it's it's no... Let's not beat around the bush. Modi is unprecedentedly popular. And I think that there has been a uh, an effort by many countries, including Western ones, obviously, to try and support Modi, to bring him on side uh, on issues. You know, America has been trying to do this for years vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, so what do you think, by how much do you think that the election could be won? And if it's won even more than the uh, 300 seats, I think he won in 2019, how 
how many more could he win? And and if that's the case, what influence do you think that could have on his um, approach to governing India and foreign policy? Uh, so I've predicted two years back that they're going to come around 350 this time. Right. Uh, easily. So that's a thumping majority. Uh, the NDA would be getting even more. The alliance will be getting even more. And what that translates into foreign policy is that uh, our foreign minister will be able to take uh, head on uh, the agendas of the global south uh, with the Western nations and especially representing in the G20 as well. So uh, you've got to know that as soon as we headed the G20 summit, um, it became G21 with the inclusion of the African Union. Yes, so we that's were, a very we fantastic were. move by him to include the African Union. I, that's a very good point. Yeah. I, I was very glad to see that he did that. Even among the BRICS nations, he is, he is very, uh, the, he is very, very popular in terms of leadership. Today, uh, if you check out Vladimir Putin, the few number of leaders that he has set with a direct bilateral, our foreign minister falls into that category of having a direct bilateral with President Putin. It's, it's a rare thing. So this is a kind of elevation of uh, the global power status that Bharat has entered now into. Uh, eventually, what that translates into foreign policy is more and more decolonization, which means uh, the history will be revisited, the scientific discoveries will be revisited, uh, the method of trade will be revisited, indexes will be revisited, education format will be revisited. Uh, all the ancient Bharat wisdom will be uh, brought back again. Uh, I mean, if you are teaching math, then math has ancient Bharat roots with the Vedic math. So uh, in each and every dimension of the society, uh, the ancient Bharat accumulated wisdom will be brought back into, into the systems. So that's a part of decolonization process that we'll see. And we not just see decolonization of Bharat alone. Uh, what we are asking is for decolonization of all the international bodies, be it United Nations, World Bank or IMF. So the leadership is also going up the ladders in those bodies as well be it World Bank, uh, Ajay Banga, or be it Gita uh, at the IMF. So our leadership is going up through the ladder over there as well. A lot of Western companies which want to survive uh, the financial reset, they've already begun uh, shifting operations to Bharat. Um, we are seeing uh, uh, a lot of meetings of Western BGs with the Prime Minister where we've been witnessing some of the frictions of uh, Western businessmen especially in terms of social media companies who are, um, you know, uh, not taking actions which the Indian government requires on accounts which do propaganda stuff, especially during election times and stuff like that. That includes Elon Musk as well. So um, uh, we, we do understand that uh, many such Elon Musks will come and go, they will cry and weep, they'll agree and they'll be happy, they'll negotiate, they'll praise, they will criticize. Uh, we are focused on a 2047 Vixit Bharat uh, target. Uh, and we don't care who comes and goes because ultimately it's not that only if you are going to get a Tesla car, you are going to get a car, right? So yeah. at the end of the day, it's a consumer who's going to decide and call all the shots of international trade. So I think what's interesting is the way you're framing your um, response is reflective of how unusual or different that Modi is approaching this election is, you know, quite unusual, th rare third term that he'll be in power. Because from my understanding of looking back at Indian elections previously, they're usually focusing on domestic issues like prices, caste equations, uh, internal corruption, as you said, going all the way back with the uh, Congress party. And foreign policy is almost not really part of campaign rhetoric when we're seeing uh, people vying for the for the leadership, except for things that are related to, you know, Kashmir, China, possibly other areas in India's near abroad. So what do you think about this? It very much oh, is. He's framing it, it very in much is. lens, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it very much is. While well, most of the, you know, uh, aged strata of the society would be still focusing on the domestic issues, mm. uh, make no mistake. All the youngsters are focused on foreign policy and geopolitics. All of them. Okay. Because they do understand that a lot of, uh, as I said, the university ranking, which are taking Indian admissions, which is why 
half of the UK, uh, Canada, Australia colleges are running based on money of the Indian parents, which are paying those fees. Uh, I mean, if you don't get two years admissions from India, uh, about half of them would shut, uh, put down their shutters. So uh, do understand that the hopes of young India has changed. We no more uh, uh, rely or depend on uh, what West sees as elite or, as I said, their indexes. Uh, we are looking forward to all those who want to serve to us would come to Bharat to serve us, which is why each of these countries are being told, you're going to enter a bilateral free trade agreement with us uh, and you're going to trade on our terms which is why we have about, I think, five to six Australian universities confirmed shifting to Gujarat uh, with their campuses. Uh, similarly, the FT and the United Kingdom is also on negotiation table as of now. Um, we believe that uh, it is it is a Bharatiya consumer which is going to call all the shots of international trade because the Chinese consumers or the Russian consumers are not going to entertain Western companies anyways. Okay, so uh, do we do understand that uh, Bharat is seeking a geopolitical role where, uh, well, where America and and the Western collective together will have to accommodate a big chunk of decision making that has to happen in Delhi. Uh, it's it's not the old India that uh, you were dealing with. Let me tell you, we when we had this, this issue with Canada, we fired forty one diplomats on the spot. All right. Yeah, but I just want so, to expand a little bit more on what you were saying because I think your foreign minister or external minister, Jashanka, if I'm saying that right, he is, I think, such a personification, right? He really embodies what India's foreign policy has has reflected in, in the past few years, 10 years more broadly, right? What do you think his approach is going to be as the BJP wins? Do you think there's going to be a renewed effort to try to resolve Kashmir, uh, to deal with some external issues with China on the border, for example, um, concerns over Afghanistan? What do you think is going to happen in that regard? Well, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, uh, uh, if you look at Bharat's position and foreign policy, we are directly dealing with Taliban from day one. In fact, Indians were the most respectable and the most most safe people in Afghanistan, even more than the Afghanistan government when the crisis was happening. Okay, and that continues today. I mean, we have bypassed even Qatar and directly deal with Taliban now. So we are not, uh, I mean, we are completely aligned with, uh, I mean, we have no issues at all with Taliban uh, on one-to-one -one basis at all. Now, as long as uh, Pakistan is concerned, we are very clear that there are two clear paths from where they are right now. One is uh, they are no more going to get those kind of funding from the West because West itself is going to face the dilution with the single country reserve currency status going. So, uh, this, their only hope is Saudi Arabia and UAE. Uh, and Saudi Arabia and UAE are completely aligned to Bharat in terms of de-radicalization and decolonization process. We see... We see the the West Asia uh, de-radicalizing with Indian Mandirs, Ayurved, and Yog, because they selected that path as a correct path to de-radicalization. They have seen the American method of de-radicalization, bombers flying on the sky. They have seen the Chinese method of de-radicalization, where they steal organs from the Muslim bodies. Uh, they safely selected Bharat. Okay. So as long as West Asia is concerned, it's completely going to be aligned to uh, what the Bharatiya geopolitical objectives be. So uh, to my understanding, Pakistan has a very clear uh, uh, direction, which is uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE can help it out with some kind of de-radicalization funding to revamp the education sector. And it will have to hand over the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir to us. Mm. That's the only, it's the only direction that they got. If they don't do that, they're going to dilute further and further and break up into multiple parts. In fact, they already have a conflict going on with Afghanistan not accepting the Duran line uh, as the border. So uh, there's no other option over there. As long as China is concerned, we are very clear that we will have to reverse two things. One is 1965 Cultural Revolution, which means uh, we want all the Mandirs revived within China. Mm. Uh, and all the ancient Bharat linkages within China to be put up to a public display. Now, whatever that linkages were, uh, our trade is already booming, at least for the last two years, it's booming. 
And, and as soon as NOC is solved, they can have a senior stock on solving the LAC as well with China. So this is this is how we think uh, it has to go in in that direction. As far as Jayashankar Ji is concerned, obviously he's a pro. Uh, the kind of foreign policy uh, miracles that he's able to turn around is something unheard of. Probably the finest diplomat on the planet right now today. He and and, and his counterpart in UAE, Anwar Gargarshi as well. Uh, these are the two big diplomats, I would say, almost scripting the new world order for the world. So uh, that is how I look uh, at foreign policy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think you're over um, confident in the Middle Eastern scenario with Saudi Arabia and, and others, but Modi's approach, I think, is quite refreshing for a lot of um, people in that region, right? Um, but one of the questions I think a lot of Western organizations or audiences, observers has is the concerns about the treatment of minorities in India. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, what's your perspective on that? Do you think that's overplayed and it's the Western sort of attempt to talk about human rights and things like that? Or, or do you think there is some uh, truth to it? Well, uh, to my understanding, uh, West, especially uh, the, the Western Europe countries are soon going to face crusades on street. Uh, I think whatever narrative that was being peddled in terms of minorities, I think the reversals will begin from the West itself. They will themselves start questioning secularism. This is my understanding. As far as the United States is concerned, uh, that it has also opened up the borders. Uh, to my understanding, it's going to face a lot of dilution in, 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 in the states in terms of law and order when there's illegals because they, come, they are coming with the expectations of freebies, assuming yeah. that that printing machine will go on. Uh, and those who are getting them in are thinking that these people will be usable for setting up the manufacturing unit of, for, as a labor purpose. I think there's going to be a fundamental clash between these two intent, uh, the people who are entering and people who think that this will be the use they will make so of the illegals. So I think uh, a lot of concepts where of human rights or climate change or religious freedom which, you know, uh, arose from the West, I think they themselves are going to revisit those concepts again after the clashes in their own nations. Okay, so the, the, there is a lot there. And for me, it's, again, I agree with you that unchecked, un, unfiltered migration, every country has a right to define what it considers to be, you know, uh, migration that it wants. Um, there's too much emphasis in more left-leaning parts of the western uh, world about you know sort of allowing people in for the sake of it and we've now got an immigration problem and a lack of assimilation people come in but they don't integrate you've got subcultures and that leads to chaos and you know being in the uk or having lived in washington dc for example i can see there is a problem with um, not all migration. Migration is obviously massively important as well, but there are a lot of negatives that come with that. So, bringing it back to the election, what do you think? To, is, to yeah. my understanding, yeah. To my just understanding, to, just to bring it into the context of India, though, because India does have a, a pretty big migration situation, you know, with Bangladesh and other countries on your borders, which I think mm -hmm. Indians have concerns with about, you know, unchecked migration. What what, what do you think could happen there? We have almost. Uh, solved as long as Kashmir is concerned, a, a big chunk of radicalization problem. Uh, as long as Bengal, which is uh, linked to the Bangladesh illegal migration that is happening, uh, we are going to have census again. So when we are going to have the new census done, we have, I think there will be a process of marking the illegals and then negotiating with Bangladesh how they are going to go back. Uh, our uh, population is concerned where we also have some concerns on radicalization. Since these are not uh, pure uh, radicals who came from West Asia, these are all converted Hindus themselves, and they realize and they also acknowledge this fact that they were uh, converted in some particular generation backwards. I think de radicalization is not going to be a very big problem as long as Bharat is concerned. Particularly after Saudi Arabia and UAE solves it 
within their own territory. Uh, how the problem would be solved for us? So um, you you emphasize de radicalization quite a lot, and I think maybe the last question I want to um, pose to you is. What do you think uh, Modi's going to focus on in his third term as leader of the country? Is he going to focus on uh, more foreign policy? Is he going to focus on de-radicalization internally, as you might frame it? What do you think his priorities are going to be? Well, uh, this particular team of the prime minister focuses on all of it because there's a there's it's like a competition cycle among the ministers to pick targets to achieve. As I said, day twice plans till twenty forty seven, and each and every date is important for the prime minister. Things have to happen on that specific dates uh, to be accomplished. Okay, so because he's reversing all the historical wrongs, so not just uh, he's not going really to focus on just one or two things because he has everything on his plate. As I said. Education sector will undergo a massive reform. We are going to see a shift from the British classroom format to a format which is going to be more digital, very less in terms of cost for the parents in terms of education, and a more focus on startup and entrepreneurship model. Because we don't want to uh, do that Adam Smith capitalism of five percent people accumulating wealth of wealth ninety percent wealth of the nation. We don't want to go down that Western path. So the decolonization process involves becoming a country of entrepreneurs, innovators, and thinkers, which means education is going to be almost negligible in cost with digital education coming in. Mm. Uh, more and more startups, low rate interest rate loans with the currency in hand. Uh, and uh, we're going to see a revival of regional integration where we see that we are going to do the net security provision for all the smaller brotherly nations in the region from Saudi Arabia till Laos, Cambodia. We just delivered Brahmos to Philippines just last, I mean, few days back. So we we envisage our role in the region as a net security provider. We are going to do the joint production and tech transfer here, uh, whoever, whichever country is interested on our terms. We are going to manufacture those weapons and supply it to all the smaller nations across. So uh, we, are, we are keen to have defense deals with the United States in particular, uh, but it has to be the tech transfer and the joint production on our terms. And to my understanding, if these deals do not happen uh, sooner, then next year, many of the American scientists would be giving interviews in Moscow. Right. Interesting. Another pretty radical claim in there. But um, I, uh, yeah, I, I certainly think that the uh, the technology aspect is something that the Americans are very keen to work with the Indians. And I think the Indians are equally the same, to be fair. There's a, a comparative advantage for both to work closer together in technology and um, advance the sy systems because it ultimately it undermines the Chinese and things like chip production for Taiwan, for example. Um, and just the whole, I think, shift in, in American foreign policy towards China, it's gone from what decoupling to high fences, low area, as they call it, basically trying to contain China on certain issues, but work with them on basic goods because you can't be completely cut off from China. Um, but India is definitely, I think, that workshop or that place where a lot of countries, as you mentioned, Tesla, uh, are wanting to come through. But um, Enkit, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, if there's any last words you'd like to leave us with, uh, anything um, you've got coming up, anything we should keep a lookout for it in this year? We'll have you back on the show, yeah. actually, of course, at some point in the next few months. Oh. In some view predictions, um, I think I would like to view one for this decade. We are moving towards China plus 10 in manufacturing. We are moving right. towards US dollar plus 10 in currencies. We are moving towards English language plus 10 in language of instruction and operation. Um, and we are going to move UNSC plus 10 as well. Wow. All right. Well, there you go, guys. We've got a we've got another infamous prediction here live on the clip. And we're very excited to see what happens about it there. But Ankit, thank you very much for your time, everyone. If you enjoyed the conversation, do check out Ankit's work, but also do support mine if you can by becoming a subscriber, liking the video, and sharing it on your relevant 
podcast platforms or with your friends. It really helps us grow as we, as I do my best to bring diverse opinions and engage people from all sides to come away better informed. But with that, everyone, I wish you peace of mind. See you in the next one.